Um, thank you for that introduction. I'm very excited to be here and talk to you about uh, this pipeline that I developed um, called AMBER, uh, which stands for Automated Maternal Behavior During Early Life in Rodents. Um, so just to get everyone on the same page about why I am interested in maternal behavior and probably you as well, um, we know that early life experiences are foundational in shaping the developing brain with effects of these experiences leading to lasting physiological adaptations in the brain and body um, that endure into adulthood and can even be uh, passed on to the next generation. They affect many domains, um, including physical and mental health, cognitive, social and emotional uh, regulation. And um, we also know that caregivers play a really important role as mediators of these early life experiences. So factors outside the infant's environment can uh, influence the infants directly, um, or sorry, indirectly through parental care. So for example, um, if the parents experiencing uh, stressors um, that are outside of the infant's immediate environment, they can uh, alter and influence infant development by changing parent-offspring interactions. Um, importantly, parents can also buffer against some of the negative effects of adverse early experiences. Um, and this idea extends to rodents as well. Um, so in rodents, the primary maternal behaviors that are often measured are shown in the bottom left picture. Um, in A, we have pup retrieval. Uh, B is showing licking and grooming. C is showing nest attendance and D is showing nursing and in particular it's showing um, this really nice arch back nursing, which is considered to be a better nursing posture in that it allows more of the pups access to the nipples for um, for nursing. Um, so while all of these maternal behaviors are really important to study. Um, there's a lot of variability in terms of how different labs study these behaviors. Some use point observations, some use continuous observations. And of course, there are also um, differences in how individual labs operationalize these particular behaviors. Um, so in that, along those lines, there are many disadvantages of this manual scoring of these behaviors. Um, it can be very time consuming. It's not well standardized, so variability between human raters within a lab, but also variability between labs, as I just mentioned. Um, and then behavior you don't actively look for is missed. So if you've recorded your behavior, you can always go back to the videos and rescore for new behaviors. Um, but if you're live scoring, you don't have this option and that information is lost. The temporal resolution is also typically not great. Um, if you're watching 20 cages at once, you're not gonna have very detailed notes on um, exactly when behaviors are starting and stopping. Um, and on the flip side of that, if you're recording behavior, you're probably not recording 24 hours a day. So you have a snapshot of a point in time of what, what's happening in that cage, but you don't have um, continuous information about uh, these behaviors. Um, so these are all reasons why automating um, the scoring of home cage maternal behavior um, would be advantageous. However, there are also challenges um, that come with not just maternal behavior in particular, but automating any home cage behavior. Um, there's a lot of variability across subjects, context, species, camera angles, um, individual cage setups in a particular lab may vary wildly and result in really different looking recordings from lab to lab. Behavior can also be erratic and short lasting and complex. Um, so this presents challenges to training these computer models to recognize. Um, when I say licking and grooming, intuitively you have an idea of what that looks like, um, but training a computer to understand what that looks like uh, takes a bit more work. Um, and then access to powerful computers uh, makes things go a lot faster. Um, this is getting a bit more accessible with web services like AWS and Google Collab, so hopefully that will continue to improve and be less of a barrier. Um, and um, some computer science knowledge is very helpful in getting these tools set up and um, establishing a pipeline, although this is also becoming a bit better. Um, so with that, those challenges in mind, we set out um, with these goals for our automated uh, maternal behavior pipeline. We wanted reliable standardized scoring uh, that's generalizable. So we didn't want to develop a pi pipeline that would only work for a particular experiment. We wanted something that could be applied across experiments and hopefully across labs as well. 
Um, we wanted it to be undisruptive, so um, not using a particular maternal behavior test. So one of the tests that's often used is the pup retrieval test in which um, you go in and you scatter the pups about in the cage, spread them around and look at how much time the dam takes to pick up the pups and return them to the nest. This doesn't happen very often um, naturally in the home cage environment, so it's it may not be a good indication of the what the pup is experiencing in terms of home uh, home cage maternal behavior. Um, we also did not want to have any specialized equipment required, so our setup is exactly what's shown in this picture here it's just a standard rat cage the food and water are in a wire top above at the top of the cage. Um, and this is just a view at one end of the cage. So we wanted, if we, by not requiring any specialized equipment, hopefully this can be used more widely um, by anyone who has access to similar cages. Um, and then also side view recordings. So a lot of um, studies that use, have automated behavior use bottom up or top down recordings. And we considered that. However, when the dam comes onto the nest, um, if you're recording from above, she's going to occlude and block the view of all of the pups in the nest, um, particularly when they're young. And so then we lose the ability to gather any information about what, what's happening with the pups. So we chose to use the side view recording. Um, and this presents a lot of challenges, uh, additional challenges in terms of uh, the, the behavior tracking, um, which I'll talk about it in a, in a few slides. Um, but this was very important to us, and so now we can see the dam and the pups, and we can have an idea, for example, um, we can actually see the looking grooming rather than try to infer it from her head moving up and down from a top view recording. We also wanted to be able to uh, gather this information during the light or dark phase, so using infrared cameras to achieve that. Um, and as I mentioned, information about the dam and pup behavior, so the behavior is bi-directional, um, what the pups do influences how the dam responds to them, so we wanted to be able to um, see and get information from both. And then, of course, uh, we wanted to reduce the human burden um, in gathering this information, so that's why a, a main goal of automating this. Okay, so for those of you who may be less familiar with supervised machine learning, um, this is this is a concept applied at several steps throughout this pipeline, so I just wanted to do a quick overview. Um, so in supervised machine learning, you're going to provide the machine or the computer with labels for the data. So in this case, um, that is the name of the shapes. Um, the machine will then take it and develop algorithms to predict um, the uh, the names of the shape um, to the shape itself, um, and it will try out those algorithms with a set of test data that was not used, it hasn't seen it before, so it wasn't used for training, and if the model's performing well, the labels will look good and they'll be accurate, and if it's performing poorly, you may have to go back and uh, provide it more labeled data to improve the model. Um, so, um, some there are software out there that have used uh, just video recordings and taken that pixel information provided in the recordings to, in order to do the behavior classification. Um, in this, this type of pipeline is very sensitive to any changes in the environment. So even the bedding moving around um, as the dams moving around in the cage could make it require immense amounts of training data in order to have um, models that will accurately predict behavior. So for this reason, um, we're using uh, the pose estimation step as an intermediate. Um, so if you're unfamiliar, pose estimation is the idea of getting, um, rather than getting behavior directly from the video, you are going to uh, have, train a, a model to uh, detect key points. So in this uh, picture, the key points are the uh, labeled numbers at the joints. Um, and it's going to learn how to where the location of each of those key points in every frame of the video. Um, you can then construct a skeleton out of that. And then that information is fed into a different machine learning tool that will do the behavior classification. So it will take the information about the coordinate data and then uh, make inferences about behavior. So this is the outline I we are using in this pipeline. Um, and this is what 
uh, the pipeline workflow looks like. So we have video recording. We then take those videos and we perform pose estimation for on the dams using single animal deep lab cut, as well as pose estimation on the pups. And this is using multiple animal deep lab cut. So deep lab cut is a po provides information about pose estimation. We combine those files um, together and then take that information and put it into a different software called Simba that will do the behavior classification. Okay, so um, our, for our video recording, we use Raspberry Pi mini computers. So they're a full desktop computer. Um, the whole computer is about the size of a credit card um, and they are equipped with infrared cameras. Um, I have headless and remote access to these computers so I can control them from my home or outside of the animal facility. Um, and I can uh, put in recording scripts where I can control very precisely different recording parameters like frame rate, brightness, contrast. Um, and I also can schedule the recordings. And so we equip each cage with, with one of these um, Raspberry Pis. Um, and we can then record from all of our cages simultaneously. Um, and then the recordings are automatically uploaded to the cloud. So by not being in the room, we've minimized any disruption that experiments or presence may have um, on behavior. Um, we can record in the light or in the dark as well. Um, so these are very handy tools. Um, and so we take those videos and we'll, um, I'll walk you through how we develop the pose estimation model for the dam. Um, so if you're unfamiliar, this is an overview of the deep lab cut workflow. Uh, you'll create a project configuration file where you will define what key points um, or body points on the dam that you would like to track. You will extract frames from your videos and then label the key points in those frames, train the model, and then evaluate the model. Um, and if needed, go back and extract and label more frames. So this is the most labor intensive part of this whole of developing this whole pipeline there. I was I spent months um, in the loop of extracting and labeling more frames until I achieved um, evaluation metrics I was happy with. So the end product of deep lab cut is what's shown on the bottom. Um, where you have for each body part, you have an X and a Y coordinate, and this is the literal coordinate in pixels of where uh, the location of that body part in the, each frame. So each frame is a row. Um, you also get a probability score that reflects the confidence the um, model has in that that is that actually the location of that body part. So here you can see that the probability score for body part one is very low in these first frames, whereas the probability for body part two is much higher. Um, so it's it's likely that body part one is occluded or not present in these first frames, but body part two is present. Okay, so we track 32 points um, on the dam. Um, so the, they're listed here. These points were selected based on what can be labeled most consistently. So if you don't have consistency in the labels you are giving to the computer to train on, it's not going to do a very good job of learning. Um, we also wanted 360 degree coverage. So this is where the side view tracking can become a major challenge. We want information about the dams um, Body, orient, uh, body position, um, regardless of the orientation she is to the camera. And when you have a side view, there are many, many orientations she can be in. Whereas if it's a top down view, there are fewer. Um, along those same lines, we wanted to be able to label some part of the dam and get information about her, regardless of whether or not she's occluded. So in the bottom left picture, you can see that she is in the back of the cage pretty far away and the top half of her body is completely blocked by the food hopper. However, since we have this many points, we can still get information about the bottom half of her body um, so we can still know her location in the cage. Um, so once we have our take our labeled frames, we then uh, train the uh, model. Um, so deep lab cut uses uh, deep neural networks to train on. Um, also of note that there's also an image augmentation step where for each label frame, it'll apply different um, kind of filters to the images. So you are training on, on many versions for each labeled frame you give it. Um, and we train this 
model to 600,000 iterations. Um, and here's what the training stats look like. Um, so as expected, for the, the longer it trains, the, uh, the loss, which is a, a model of, sorry, a measure of model performance uh, or model error drops and plateaus. Um, and then we can also take a look at our test frame. So the figure on the right is showing the error between the labels I provided the computer um, for the test frames and um, the, the um, labels it is predicting. Um, so we see that error go down as the training iterations increase. Um, of course, there's also visual inspection of uh, plotting of those test frames. Um, so you want to visually inspect to make sure that it's not one body point that's not performing well and increasing the error, um, that there's pretty good uh, predictions across all body points. And of course, the best way to see if your model has good performance is to apply it to some videos. So I picked this clip because she's on the nest, she's spinning around, there's a lot of different orientations. Um, and our points are staying for the vast majority exactly where they should be. Um, and they are also on the dam. They are not being transferred to the pups um, as she kind of digs around in the nest and nuzzles the pups. Okay, so to the next step is to do the pup post estimation. And for this, we will also use deep lab cut, this time using a multi-animal um, project, which has a slightly different workflow. So the first half of the workflow is very similar to single animal deep lab cut, where you create a project configuration, you tell it what body points you would like to track, you then extract and label frames, and this time you're labeling, um, for, you're labeling the body points for all of the individuals in a frame. You train the model, you evaluate the model, and this at this stage you'll have all of what's called detection so it will give you it will return all of the pos all of the likely detections for all of the body points so it will give you all of the possible pup nose points um, in the video. However, it these points are have not been assigned to individual skeletons yet so that's what's happening during the second half of the multi animal deep deep lab cut workflow. Um, so it uses information within and across frames to assign these detections to individual uh, pups. Okay, so um, our, we chose to use nine body or track nine body points, uh, basically from the tip of the nose to the base of the tail in a straight line um, on each pup. So here are some examples of labeling. We labeled pups beginning on postnatal day one um, and as old as postnatal day 14. This is important to mention because pups can look very, very different um, as they grow up. And by the time they're P14, they actually start to share a lot of similar features um, as the dam. So they have a similar coat pattern. Um, so we need to train it to make sure it's not going to track the dam. And it's going to continue to only track pups. Um, also worth noting is that there's a lot of overlap between individuals, um, and this is the main reason we didn't track any side points. It becomes very difficult for deep lab cut to determine whether um, a side point belongs to uh, pup one or the pup right next to it. Um, so, so for this reason, we just tracked uh, the skeleton straight down the spine. Okay, so he, um, there. The training parameters um, are shown above, and then here are our, our model training stats. Um, Multi-animal deep lab cut trains much faster, so we only train to 80,000 iterations um, and are basically achieving fairly good error uh, beginning at the first benchmark, which was 10,000 iterations. So that's why the um, model average error or RMSE is uh, more flat in, in this uh, model compared to the dam model. Um, and of course, the best way to check if your uh, tracking is doing what's, what it's supposed to is to have it label some videos. So here we have older pups um, on, the, on the left and younger pups on the right. Um, and the dots are staying on the pups down the spine. And importantly, they're not on the dam or elsewhere in the cage. Um, so this, is, this looks fairly good. So this, so th so at this stage, we've um, done the first half that I showed you the detections. 
Um, and so now getting into the second half, this is where those individual points will start being assigned to, um, uh, sorry, the, the detections will start being assigned to individual pups. Um, and so the videos shown here are, is the tracking for the same video before um, and after this step. So as you can see, there's some information loss um, where points that were present in the detections are no longer present and haven't been assigned. And there's a lot of jumping around of uh, the different colors indicate the individual, the specific individual. So there's a lot of jumping around of that in the video. So for this reason, we chose to use the detections um, rather than the, uh, the, the detection output of the pup model rather than the output after the points have been assigned to individuals. Um, and so in thinking about this, um, a, a, a big reason we landed on this decision is that we can, in, in applying this to the behavior classifier, we're considering the pups as a unit. We wanna know where the pups are in the cage so we know where the nest is to be able to um, score these maternal behaviors. Um, so we're less concerned about whether this nose point belongs to pup one or pup two, but more concerned about as a whole, where are the pups in the cage? Okay, so to this point, we've done pose estimation for dams, pose estimation for pups. We then combine these uh, files, they're exported as CSVs, so it's just joining them together. Um, and then we will proceed to the behavior classification step. Okay, so um, the Simbo workflow also starts with project configuration. So here you're gonna let it know what behaviors you're going to train it um, to identify. You're gonna give it the body part configuration. So for this project, we have 32 points on the dam, and then I've trained it on nine points for up to eight pups. So this uh, brings us to a, a total of 146 body points um, that we're providing it with our tracking information. Although I will, um, as you can imagine, a lot of the pup points are occluded or missing from different frames. So while it, it could be up to that many points, it's likely for each frame, it's likely much less. Um, so we import our videos and we import our pose estimation data the next step is to define video settings. Um, so one of the uh, video settings you need to define is the pixels per millimeter for each video. Um, so this allows for adjustments for different distances from the camera. So that's shown here, one, one camera is much closer and one's further away, um, but also different video resolutions. So it doesn't matter if you record at the same resolution that I recorded on, you would be able to apply this model uh, because there's this normalization step. Um, this, this is a little bit tricky because of the side view and the depth problem. So the pixels, pixels per millimeter is going to be, um, you're going to have fewer pixels per millimeter in the back of the cage compared to the front of the cage. Um, so to kind of standardize and get around that problem, I chose to measure the distance of the food hopper um, because it was present in all of the videos, and it's also about, um, it hits in the middle of the cage. Um, so that's the landmark I chose to use. Um, and then Simba also has a very nice outlier correction of pose estimation data um, for reasons that I won't get into during the talk, but I'm happy to talk about afterwards. Um, I skipped this step and just used my raw tracking data. The next step for Simba is to do feature extraction. So Simba is not going to actually learn the behavior classification based off of the coordinate data. It's going to learn to classify the behavior based off of these features that are derived from the coordinate data. Um, so I, using a custom script, um, we extracted 217 features. Um, 11 of those features were derived from PUP coordinate data information. Um, and they fell into two categories. We have the coordinate information, which might be uh, location um, within a frame, um, as well as areas. So uh, an example of area would be like the convex hall. What, what is the, how big of an area is the, are the pups taking up in the frame? Um, those can be also divided into a type where you have location, which would be like the location of a coordinate in the frame, um, probabilities, means, and sums. And they can also be looked at in terms of what time bin they refer to. So the 0.03 seconds um, is within 
a frame or between frames because we recorded at 30 frames per second. Um, the one tenth of a second is just would refer to rolling bins or um, rolling sums across a tenth of a second. Um, we don't have this for the pup features, but there's also a one second window and then finally a two second window. So example features for pups would be the Y coordinate of the pup centroid point for each um, for each frame. Um, or the two second rolling average of the convex hull of all pop points. The majority of features were derived from dam points, so 200 features um, that rely on dam coordinate information. Um, and we have the same categories with the two additional categories of distances and movements. Um, an example of a movement would feature would be the, the movement of the dam's nose point across frames. Um, and an example of a distance feature would be the distance for the dam's nose to the uh, base of the tail. So that would change um, depending on whether she's further back in the cage or closer to the front. And then the last six features um, were derived from both dam and pup points. Um, so this, an example of one of these features would be the distance between the pup centroid um, and the dam centroid. So we can look at um, where they are relative to each other in the frame. Okay, the next step is to add, append your behavior annotations to the tracking data. Um, so we scored for seven behaviors, nest attendance, active nursing, passive nursing, licking and grooming, self-directed grooming, and then both eating and drinking. Um, and here are very kind of general behavior uh, definitions. But we actually have a very long detailed document that um, outlines exactly when a behavior starts and when it stops because Simba is going to be trained on the frame level. It's very important to have um, very precise uh, accuracy in terms of like exactly when in the video a behavior starting and stopping to uh, facilitate uh, the model uh, learning well. Okay, so we took all of this information um, and we Simba uses random forest classifiers um, with these hyperparameters to develop models for each of these behaviors. Um, so these just show the number of frames that each particular behavior was present in. Um, we trained it on 30 or 25 videos, depending on the behavior uh, behavior classifier. Um, worth noting is that passive nursing was a relatively infrequent behavior. So we also performed random undersampling in that model um, to make the uh, frames where the behavior is present and absent a bit more equal. Um, and here are accuracy measures. Um, so we have precision and recall, which take into account false positives and false negatives uh, respectively. And then the F1 score, which is the harmonic mean of precision and recall and accounts for both. So for all of these accuracy measures, uh, zero would be very poor, the worst performing and one is the best. Um, so we're getting very high performance um, measures, which is great. We can also um, visualize these performance measures um, across different discrimination thresholds. So discrimination threshold is the probability or score at which the positive class is chosen over the ne negative class. Um, so we can adjust this threshold to increase or decrease the sensitivity to, to false positives. Um, so here, what we see is that the accuracy measures remain high across a, a pretty wide range of discrimination thresholds, um, which suggests that um, it, it should be relatively robust. Um, and of course, the best way to uh, look evaluate your model is to try it out on a held out video. So here, this is showing um, uh, a validation video of licking and grooming. So right now, the dam is off the nest. When she comes onto the nest, you'll see licking and grooming display when the um, behavior classifier is counting licking and grooming in the frame. So you may also notice there's some flickering and that's because Simba is um, calculating these behaviors on the frame level. So you can do things down the line, some post-processing like Kleinberg burst detection to group these behavior bouts into one bout um, if, if you would like. 
Um, you can also set minimum bout lengths. So you can um, tell Simba when, when calculating these behaviors, only count it as looking grooming if it occurs for at least half a second long. So in this video, I haven't um, done any of that. Um, and so here's another held out video, this time just showing a Gantt plot of all the behaviors. The top is from a highly trained experimenter scored. Um, and then the bottom is what the machine score looks like. Um, so it looks like our model is performing well, although these random forests are a bit of a black box. We've given it all of these features, but what, which of these features are actually important for making decisions about behaviors? So to try to take a peek under the hood and figure out um, how it's using these features to make decisions, we can do two things. We can run feature importance permutations, and we can uh, look at shapely additive explanations or SHAP. Um, so the first way, uh, looking at the feature importance permutation distributions, um, this is in, in this method, you are going to um, look at the decrease in the model score when you, um, for each particular feature, when you um, randomly shuffle the values for, for that feature. Um, so the decrease in the model score when that single feature is randomly shuffled. So you're turning what was once a signal into noise and you see, you look at the reduction in model performance. Um, so here are the um, histograms of the feature importance based off of the different feature categories. Um, and I think the take home here is that it, the area information seems to in general have higher feature importance scores relative to some of the other uh, categories. You can also look individually, I won't go through these, um, but you can look at each individual model and just look at the top features. Um, and so some of, some of what we're seeing is a lot of um, coordinate information. Um, we see rolling sums and roll, uh, rolling averages across frames. The more interesting way to uh, determine what features are contributing to your models is to do this SHAP analysis. So um, SHAP is going to take um, what starts off as the base rate. So the base rate is just how, if you take a random frame from your training set, what's the likelihood that that frame is, um, has a behavior present? Um, and that depends on the frequency of the behavior overall in your uh, data set. So we had um, nested tendons occurring at about 60% of our training frames. Um, so the base rate for nested tendons would be 0.6. Um, it's the models then looking at the features and then coming up with some probability in the output of whether or not the behavior is uh, present or absent. So what SHAP does is it, looks at whether for each value of the feature is that increasing or decreasing the probability of the behavior happening so there, it's more or less assigning weights um, that will lead to the final output um, so here are the shap scores for nest attendance um, colored by category so we have um, the the features that are contributing the most to both increasing and decreasing the probability that nest attendance is happening is the centroid point um, y coordinate uh, for the dam and also the dam centroid y coordinate of her whole body. Um, and this makes sense to me because the pups are um, in the front of the cage, um, so they're physically lower down in the frame. And so as the dam comes close to the pups, the y coordinate of these centroid points is changing. Um, so it makes sense to me that the Y coordinate would be predictive of whether or not nest attendance is happening. However, it's still just one contribution. It's um, um, to the probability output. All of these other features um, are, are also contributing. Um, here are the top SHAP scores for all models. Um, it's colored by model this time. Um, and you can see that some of the more polarized features are for um, nest attendance and active nursing. And those are the models that are we're seeing perform the most robustly um, across all, all of our different videos. Um, they're also the models where, or sorry, they're also the classifiers where the base rate is closer to 50%. Um, 
so you have both uh, a need to increase probability, but also decrease probability, as opposed to act, uh, passive nursing, where it already the base rate is already so low, it's 0 0.03. Um, decreasing probabilities from there isn't isn't really going to change uh, the behavior prediction as much. You can also um, collapse these by feature category, um, and I think this is interesting to look at because you can see that uh, nest attendants and licking grooming are using movement information very differently. Um, so nest, uh, nest attendants is movement information is not having a big effect on whether nest attendants um, probabilities change. Uh, this makes sense because if she's on the nest and she's nursing, she's very still, whereas if she's on the nest and she's licking grooming, the dam is very active. Um, and on the other hand, licking grooming is using a lot of movement information to make decisions. It would be very hard to perform licking and grooming without moving at all. Um, so this makes sense to me. You can also look um, divide these features up by time frame. Um, and I think the take home here is that the overall all models seem to be using both the frame level, so the 0 0.03 seconds information um, most, and then followed soon by the two second time bin. So those seem to be the most informative for making behavior decisions. Okay, so we've achieved an automated analysis in a standard home cage environment from side view recordings. Um, it can be, we can capture video both in the light and the dark. Um, we have information about dams and pups, and it's been generalizable to videos outside of those it was trained on. So the overall, now that we have these models built, the overall workflow would, um, be what's shown on the right, video recordings, tracking for dams and pups, joining those files together, and then um, putting them in Simba using our feature extraction script um, and then running the models. There are some limitations to point out. Um, so the post estimation tracking right now is optimized for long ebon rats, but we're also expanding this to include other strains of rats and mice. Um, the behavior classifiers are only trained on side view data, so they will, I don't think um, they will generalize well, if at all, to any top down or bottom up um, videos. Um, and right now it requires deep lab cut and Simba installation. Um, and deep lab cut, of course, runs much faster uh, if you have a computer with a graphics card. Um, and these models take time to run. They're, this is not instantaneous information. However, I will say computers don't mind working nights and weekends. So um, although they still take time to run, it, it can save you a lot of time um, and give you a lot of interesting information. Um, so I just want to touch on a few applications. Um, we, you can use this just as I presented it um, to do automated home cage maternal behavior using the classifiers um, we've developed. Or you can build your own classifiers, um, use the pose estimation data, and then train a new Simba model on a, on a different behavior you're interested in. Um, you can also extract continuous behavior measures. Um, so Simba provides binary, present, absent, is the behavior happening or not. Uh, but I also think there's real potential to, turn, to use the pose estimation data to um, look at more continuous measures. So this is just showing an example. Um, for a lot of uh, rodent maternal behavior, there's this, uh, there's sometimes manual scoring where you're looking at um, nursing posture and people differentiate between a low crouch and a high arch back nursing. Um, so those are, those are kind of categorical low or high, uh, but those in reality exist on a continuum. Um, and so we, you could actually extract curvature of the spine during nursing. Um, using this data and actually curvature of the spine is one of the features that we've included in Simba. Um, so you could just extract that information directly um, and analyze that. Um, you could also run unsupervised behavior clustering. Um, so this would look for patterns in the pose estimation or features that you that um, that you have not kind of a priori told it to look for. Um, so you may discover things about your data that you didn't necessarily uh, hypothesize going in. Um, you could also use the, pup, the pup tracking to extract pup behavior. Um, so for instance, pup movement. Um, and this is something we're doing in the, the lab now with the goal of looking at bi-directional behavior um, and behavioral contingency with time series analysis. Um, the recording setup we have allows you to do kind of 
24 hour more time lapse low frame rate um, recordings to capture behavior patterns. Um, so those could be applied uh, or used in this pipeline to um, to look at behavior over really long periods of time, which may be a better indicator of patterns of behavior, which we know are important um, signals for the developing brain. Um, so that might be more informative than these kind of one hour or point observations. Um, and then these post estimation models can be applied to any side view. So in order to use the dam tracking uh, model, you don't necessarily, no pups have to be present. Um, so if you're interested in uh, kind of tracking more generally and not necessarily in a uh, home cage dam litter environment, you could also use these post estimation models um, to just track a single animal um, and do a completely different experiment. Um, and with that, I'd like to acknowledge my advisor, Francis Champagne, um, and the other people in our lab who contributed to this project, um, our funding through NIH, um, and I'll be happy to take any questions.